redefining communication, and especially when you're looking at your uh, dashboards. Greylock, obviously, we, I got a privilege of looking at some of the demos of Greylock. You have a great dashboard interface. And so if you think about it, when you think about people who are consuming information on dashboards, we're seeing a complete redefinition of um, the communication um, in terms of talking to, that, um, to the user, per se, with the data. Um, we also have a lot of data powerhouses. We have the right infrastructure that can power our LLM, LLM models. And um, there's kind of different goals when you think about how to think about AI when it's integrated with dashboards. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Once I got to Open, uh, open Search, and I don't know if you worked with the Open Search dashboard. Some of you may have, some of you may not have. You have your own um, delivery method. But when we're looking at it, um, one of the key differentiators that we wanted to think about is the user type per se. So people who set up the developers, who set up the dashboards, and they're setting up dashboards um, for either for their own consumption, for their own visualization, their own consumption, or an end user consumption. So someone who's going to monitor and kind of make decisions based on what they're seeing on the dashboard. So I just want to make these two distinctions because that's a little bit of what informs um, the study as well. And so um, the biggest differentiation here is the scale of consumption. So think of it this way. You've set up your dashboards. And I think when I think about Greylock dashboards, you guys set up your dashboards, but you have the ability to set up tabs so you can go deeper into the data as you need and also kind of like log that there as a monitoring uh, kind of opportunity. So the difference here between the two users is the scale of consumption. Oftentimes when I talk to those different users, one of them is thick in the data, they understand data, they don't really need a dashboard for them to interpret the data, they conceptually understand that data and they're the producer type. And then there's the other ones who are consumers. So for example, if you set up a dashboard, you'd set it up and give it off to someone to monitor and their role is, okay, you monitor it, you find a threat, you kind of like ameliorate the threat detection, you you know close the ticket, you say, okay, we solved it, things like that. Oftentimes, they require the assistance of the dashboard because it really helps them slice, dice, look at the data in detail. And so they're a little, slightly different type of customer. They do understand data, but not as intimately as the producer. And so these roles, um, I've documented in a block, if you ever see open search blocks, things like that, the original conception of these roles are kind of important, especially when we start creating laddered up curated experiences. And it's also really important when we're thinking about AI per se. Um, so when we think about um, you know, applications of this, especially in the log analytics world, things like monitoring security breaches, uh, monitoring uh, per se, like when you have a security breach going in, doing some kind of root cause analysis, monitoring, and also compliance. So those are some of the applications. And so we wanted to understand usage of this because obviously we're looking at a new interaction apart from the visualizations on the dashboards itself, which is when we started this conversation about reactive versus proactive um, usage, just to give some definitions, user needs for um, defining uh, proactive uh, uses are for monitoring, right? Compliance, and I was having conversations with some of you yesterday, this doesn't this rarely happens, but it could happen. And in case you're trying to set up an infrastructure, in case you're trying to build out that particular capability for someone who's got that vision, those users will fall in that particular case where they're trying to establish a new system per se. You also have, whoops. You also have the um, reactive cases where you do have that threat detection, something unusual happens. You might be setting up alerting or monitoring or alerting. Uh, we have alerting within uh, open search dashboards that we kind of use and then any kind of uh, breaches. So in this particular case, users will go in, do a post or a mortem. And usually these cases are a little bit more immediate. You need to quickly fix this particular um, use uh, as, as well. So just to give you a sense of where all this data is coming from, we recruited uh, folks from the community, so our contributors, most of our developers. Uh, for those of you who have not been to our community meetings, we do run community meetings twice a month um, with our community members, with the contributors, and we discuss some of these. So for this, um, we actually recruited uh, folks from the community to talk to, seven individuals, and also spoke to a few um, solutions architects, so that informs the study. And one of the things I quickly found out talking to these um, producers, so these developers who are setting up dashboards is 
they kept talking about the use of AI for their immediate use. And I'll share some of the findings here. But essentially, they were talking about things like running queries, looking up documentation, helping them set up dashboards. So their usage started to seem very different. And so went in and also did a survey in around 38 um, users there of dashboard users. And these are um, Kibana, Grafana, OpenSearch, Tableau, QuickSight uh, users all from the community who provided their insights as well on how they would use um, dashboards. So a couple of key insights findings to share with the team here, first by producers. Um, they had very different needs. They wanted to customize their assistance. They actually don't think about going to the assistance to start off with. They might think of setting up the assistance for their end consumers, but their needs are very different. They don't want to interfere with the algorithm that's going to deliver to the user. Like they'd rather make the connections, the wirings, and leave it alone and let the model do its thing. They don't even want to fine tune it or any of those things. They trust um, you know, the information that's given, and so that's that. Again, they would always think about their particular use case in terms of how the assistant could help them, per se. And then uh, we saw uh, some of the popular assistance in terms of you know, the location, tone, modality. Um, there was some variation there, which is why we went in with the survey, because that's statistically a little bit more robust in its findings. So uh, I'll share with that with you in a second. And then um, we had um, developers who were starting to wonder about some of the technical capabilities to set up um, the assistance as well. Um, and then, of course, they wanted the assistant to kind of resolve issues as well. So, so those, some of those were the findings for the producers. Again, again, these are developers setting up um, the dashboards. They needed um, some kind of assistance in terms of the best visuals that they could find to put on the dashboards, help with identifying patterns or patterns and errors. Um, and they also wanted real clear results um, that could demonstrate trust. So I'll actually talk about trust towards the end in terms of the recommendations. But this came up time and again. And I think we talk a lot about that amongst ourselves as well in terms of how do we know we can trust this particular, like the results that are coming up. And that was really important for them. Some of the suggestions that producers actually provided was to provide underlying reasons of why are you presenting so-and-so result to the consumer. So it's not actual accuracy, that's one of the things, but in order to reinforce trust, they wanted to demonstrate to the customer or to the end user um, how that particular model was created and how that particular result was presented uh, to the user per se. Um, again, a lot of technical focus on documentation, a lot of technical focus on um, um, what the um, producer themselves are doing in terms of the queries, in terms of suggestions, things like that. All right, so this is the, the results from the larger, um, um, larger survey. We did have, because we're looking at dashboards that are both, um, uh, that are both log analytics and other generic dashboards, these findings are the ones from just log analytics users. And so we'll screen this off. We have around 19 log analytics users, predominantly self-disclosed as using Kibana um, for their dashboarding solution. So that's a little bit about the sample there. And then some of the data they're looking at, half of them looking at log analytics traces, any kind of operations uh, data. And when we ask them what they would like to do with the AI, keep in mind these are consumers. So these are people who disclose that they do not set up the data for dashboards. They're viewing dashboards for making strategic decisions or you know, you know, closing tickets, kind of solving, doing root cause analysis, things like that. So these individuals, very interestingly, also mentioned that they would actually use it to run a query, which is interesting because we're thinking they're going to monitor the dashboards and leave it as is, but they did disclose that they did want to look at uh, queries. And then again, even though they're consumers, they're still wanting to look at the documentation in terms of how to use the dashboard. So like the producers, searching up documentation in context of the dashboards was really important for them as well. All right, so the larger sample, and these are individuals, like I mentioned earlier, they are a wide range of dashboard consum consumers, so around 385. Most of them mentioned that they use it um, for metrics consumption. And when we said metrics, it was performance metrics, business metrics, a whole host of metrics that they were consuming on their particular dashboards. 
Most of them had not used AI on dashboards before. Um, and so that was kind of interesting. Uh, and then a few of them said they did, but we didn't probe into uh, which, uh, you know, which kind of uh, tool they were using for this. Here we see that there's a spread uh, with kind of in terms of performance me metrics kind of being the most uh, used by managers. So a lot of managers that were part of the sample. And one of the key findings here was they were looking at a lot of performance metrics. We did have some uh, spread between operations and log metrics in this particular data. So this is just sample information for the larger sample. Um, and so when we started asking them, because this was something that we wanted to guide some of our decisions as we think through the potentials of what an AI assistance can be, um, a lot of them, um, so 23%, had mentioned that they wanted to make they wanted the AI to give them very specific answers. This is, a, this is a deviation from how we see our users using dashboards. So rather than monitor things and kind of look at data in terms of uh, making their own inferences, they'd rather have a very specific answer to a very specific question that they're asking. Um, and then we also, insights was a huge thing that came up, the so what. The, all right, this is all the things that the data is showing us. We have these traces, we have these logs, we have these KPIs, but the so what? What is it that it means in terms of the underlying data and what can I do, uh, kind of the follow through. There were also some other interesting patterns in terms of the use of the AI. We had um, responses such as, what is the best graph to use? Um, where can I find the data? That was, that was also very interesting in terms of where can I find that particular visual? So um, in open search dashboards, we have dashboards that are created and individual graphs that are called as visuals. So in terms of creating an actual dashboard, you can go in, you can actually play with the data, slice and dice, this is as a producer, select a particular visual, and then drop that on the dashboard. So from a consumer perspective, so the person who's cons consuming the dashboard, they don't know where the graph is. So you might provide an insight, the AI might provide an insight, they don't know exactly where to go, where to find this data, which tab to go, so on and so forth. So some of that navigation help as well are types of questions that um, users express that they might ask of um, the AI assistant as well. And then we wanted to get a little bit into the use and feel. Um, we wanted to know in terms of the design, where would we want to keep it? Is it supposed to be persistent? Is it supposed to be um, you know, um, always kind of like, or do they want to evoke it? Um, most of them, more than 50%, wanted it to be evoked. They are, um, what they indicated was they have a normal way of consuming dashboards. They don't want that interfered. They just want to evoke. They don't want to start with talking to AI. They want to start with the visual. They want to start with evoking um, the AI assistant. And then they want to, you know, ask questions um, of the particular data that's uh, displayed to them as well. Um, other questions that would help some of the design decisions, how would you want to evoke it? Very common um, kind of call out is give us a button, we will pop it out, and then we'll ask that uh, question uh, of the AI. And then what would you like to do with it? Search in natural language came up again. And again, these are dashboard um, users of, this, this is a larger sample as well. So that's a spread of that. Ask relevant documentation, natural language, consistent theme. And these are all open-ended questions that were coded. So we were not prompting them of the different capabilities, just getting their expectations of what they would do as well. All right, uh, in terms of UX-related uh, questions, like I mentioned to you, when we talked to the producers, there was a little bit of variation, but really small sample of seven, so we couldn't tell. But we're getting a lot more kind of robust findings with um, the consumers, per se. In terms of location, over 50% or close to 70% said they are very fixed in terms of the expectation of where they would like to find it, which is very interesting when you think about a dashboard and the way that a dashboard is actually laid out. It's very interesting that they have this um, kind of sense of, or a mental model of where they would expect to see an assistant, especially because most of them had never seen an AI assistant that is associated with dashboard before. So these are just spontaneously spontaneous inferences coming out. They're very firm about the location, and the most popular location was, of course, on the right, on the top, and then we've talked to some of them as well. They'd like it to start at the top and then see a record of that, see a history of that, so on and so forth. Um, questions about interface and format. 
Most of them, like I mentioned before, we talked about the persistent versus being evoked. This needs to be a secondary interface. Um, it also speaks to the mental model that consumer, the, the dashboard consumers have in terms of always looking for information on the dashboard and then only evoking a secondary interface to assist what they're learning from what they're seeing on the dashboards per se. And when we ask them what format your assistant will be, chat window, most popular, again, this is uncued, but they assume that if it's an AI assistant, it needs to be in the form of a chat window. A few of them actually asked a search bar and that's very like, think about it in terms of the query. Like when you put, you have a query window where you can go in and type your query. So they're talking about it in the form of a search bar. Um, and then other things, we explored that widgets. We have all those open-ended kind of uh, responses to that as well. Something that's very important with um, AI assistants is how we talk to them. Like, because we had mixed kind of responses from the producers, um, very common um, anecdotes where we know it's a chat bot, we do not want personalized conversations with them. So you've probably, you know, uh, chatted with the chat bot where it says, hello, how's your day? And all that friendly comes. Producers were a little more robust in saying, we do not want to have a conversation with the chat bot. Just give me what I'm looking for. Let it be super technical. Cut out all the tone and the friendliness and all that. We're going to type a question, tell you what we want, we'll get it. So I was really curious about this with the consumers as well. Um, a lot of them didn't have a preference. Again, they did not have a prior uh, model, um, so to speak. Um, we did have individuals who were saying, yes, we want text. Some of them said voice, and you can see a correlation between how technical, because we did capture role of these consumers. The more technical they are, the more they want things in text. The less, so we, we call it as high code and low code. So the more low code they are, they're fine with voice. It's like, okay, we'll have this particular conversation. So there's kind of a correlation between how low code they are and how much human-like they'd like the AI to be. And then when we asked them to describe the nature of the conversation, the most was casual, natural uh, language, and narrative. Again, these are consumers of dashboards, so you can see that distinction between your more high, uh, highly uh, technical um, developers versus people who are actually consuming data from the dashboard wanting more human-like characteristics. And one of the things that came out was um, uh, conversations. So many of them mentioned, when I asked them, how would you describe the conversation? They went into, we'll ask questions, we expect to have this two-way conversations. So you can see a split between your high-tech and low-tech right there between your producers and consumers right there. Producers being more succinct, more to the point, give us exactly what we need versus consumers still wanting the answer, but wanting it in a way that is a little bit more freeform and natural, um, so to speak. Um, and then there was a split when we asked them to categorize the communication with the AI. It actually said both formal and informal, and this was actually in terms of the language, the content of language. So there's not the style of language, but this is, you know, in terms of the sentence construction, grammar, and your language delivery. Um, some of them wanted it as formal, some of them as informal. These are things, we did ask them about customizability, things like that this is one of those things that they would like to customize um, by need per se. All right, to wrap up here, some of the recommendations here. Uh, I haven't gone um, into trust, into the results of trust, but there were lots of comments about trust, both from the producers. We have cataloged all the open-ended uh, responses on trust. The main thing being um, the accuracy of results, which is important for the consumers. Uh, the producers, of course, because they're enabling um, some of the consumption of this wanted the underlying reason for why some of the results are there. Consumers just say, give me accurate results. That'll boost my trust. Uh, personalization was important. When we asked them about personalization, everything from tone to appearance to the personality to the naming to the color of the... Um, so lots of different UX elements there as well that they wanted customized as well. Um, and then, uh, again, other things in terms of customizability was the names, the length of the answers, color location, all of those as well. Very specific, there's a tr uh, trace on the log analytics uh, users was that ability to seamlessly translate between the query and the visual and the other way as well. So they wanted to be able to take a visual, 
show me the underlying query, and then I want to incorporate it wherever I can. So that fluidity um, that they were requesting, so, so uh, good to incorporate that with an AI assistance as well. Um, accuracy of results, users do trust um, uh, AI assistance based on what they're seeing, if it's accurate, if it makes sense, and again, providing that underlying reason, where did they come in from, and where can they go in, double down, double, you know, click and check, check whether the results are accurate, and kind of drill down there as well. Um, and then, of course, creating any kind of functional um, kind of tone for conversations does boost uh, the confidence in the AI as well. Um, some of the um, other recommendations are uh, preference for UX in terms of the chatbot experience as well. Um, in terms of wanting that chatbot-like experience, it seems to be part of the mental model and in co normal conversation. Like when you ask them what style, chatbot is pretty common in terms of their, um, you know, they, they know how that should be designed and look and feel of that as well. Um, and then also the AI assistant interface in terms of user, users uh, who prefer the AI assistants to be their secondary interface. So um, as we introduce it in the dashboards, making sure that that's either customizable or an option as well, and any kind of other desired customizable operation as well. And then to kind of uh, conclude here, um, in terms of trust, like I mentioned to you, there's lots of different spontaneous inferences on how to trust the AI. This seems to be um, part of the mental model of both consumers and producers, but getting, we as developers know how we can trust results because it's rather factual. For consumers, it's pretty fluid. So working towards creating those, um, building towards um, you know, a framework of how to trust results, how to trust um, findings, um, some, of the, uh, some of the suggestions we got were in terms of how did other users rate the findings. So finding these kind of heuristic methodology to boost trust is important for um, AI assistant users as well. All right, with that, I do want to conclude. Open Search does have a blog that we put out to the community. Results of this findings will be up on that as well. So do uh, look that up. And if you have any questions, either now or after, happy to continue the conversation either here or virtually. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Aparna. So um, we do have a, I'm gonna start instead of in the room, we got a question on the Zoom that I, and I think you covered it at the last slide, okay. but the community meetings, more information about this, where do they go to find, find this? Yeah, so we have a great marketing um, group that do the community meetings um, twice, a, uh, twice a month, and they actually have the time zone, it's time zone friendly, uh, for international community and also to make sure they get some sleep and things like that. You can find all that information on opensearch.org. Gotcha. We do have, and since you're asking about where to find stuff, they put a lot, out a lot of stuff. Um, you can find more information on the forums, right? Um, the blogs, and then their presence on social is very active. Twitter, LinkedIn, um, all these areas. So yeah, they are very, very they over communicate. So you, can, you should be able to find them. Uh, when in doubt, go ahead and reach out to me. I'll connect you to either Patty, because our partners are connected to Patty, but the community is connected to either Nate Boot or uh, Chris Frieden. Okay, yes, and we can also, um, for anybody that's online from the Greylog side, we can also connect to, to Patty or Chris. We know them very well, yeah. too. Yeah, Chris is the perfect for community meetings. Okay, yeah. and it's open search. Greylog has also participated in those community meetings, and so we, we encourage people to go there. Any, um, any, oh, and also if you're looking for deep information, I went to Aparna's personal website, and there is a list. Like I just felt more intelligent reading all the papers that she, the headlines of the papers that she's written. So if you want deep knowledge, go to Aparna's website. You'll find the research, and and everything else is there. Um, any questions though? While we have her, yeah. Uh, I hate being this guy again. Sorry. Do it, do it. Um, so. Us, uh, I say us, uh, people who work in this industry, we have a really good idea of, of what these uh, technologies can do. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Um, other people who are not privy to this industry, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what exactly uh, AI, machine learning, all this stuff does. Uh, in your opinion, um, is there any, should people be worried about any of these technologies? 
coming coming into the forefront of, of our of this generation? I love that question. There's a hidden question behind that. Um, so let's, there are two parts of your question. Um, and I really like it because coming to Open Search and even being part of the um, UX community, things like that, I think I always start research with the who. Because when we are developing solutions for our customers, we come in with exactly that knowledge that you say we know how to make it work. We have that technical prowess. We know how to put out the right engineering solution. But the who is important because an open search is unique because we have a lot of tech, like our users are technically really savvy. They know how to make it work and they know how to make it work for their end users. So they typically don't have similar questions like their users do. So there's kind of a layering of individuals that's happening. And so it's always important to consider who are you asking that question of. So when you ask the question of individuals who understand the technology, there is a level of trust that they have because they're doing this. They're engineering the solution. And that's very different of the end user that they're working for, which we just put it simplistically as a low code. They're more, when I say low code, they have highest business knowledge. Their context is really strong in terms of the business solution they're solving. When they see that KPI go from 12 to 8, when they see the logs go in from, you know, whatever, um, I'm going to lean on you for some of that information there. But when they see a variation in visual and double click on it, start filtering, drilling down on it, the sense that they're making of that data is very different than the sense that a very highly technical user is making of it. Now think about it themselves. They don't know if it's the right data source they've connected to. They don't know what the person who set up the dashboard did. And you know they don't know if they validated it the right way. They don't know if it's got the fresh data or not. So they're, you're looking for these heuristics that they themselves cannot go, or even if they had the data in front of them, they could not discern because they are not the high code individual. And so now if you ask them, do you trust the information presented? How are they going to answer that? They don't know how they got that. So that's really important. And I think that's the reason I'm at least laddering between the two, because the domain expertise is really important. When you have a technical domain expertise, for example, I'm a data modeler. If you asked me a product and you trust it, and this is what some of I've seen our initial anomaly detection users do. They will set up anomaly detection. They will simulate the model based on the underlying model schema. They will look at what's showing up. They will look at the insight. They will go and do the whole thing themselves and calibrate the two to see if it matches, right? Our low-code users are not going to do that. They require these tools to make sense of the data. So I think of it like a telescope thing. So they're going to judge the lens and say, am I looking at the right thing? They can't tell. So the telescope needs to be crystal clear and give them some metrics and indices. And so I kind of feel from a UX perspective, there's one thing which is looking at data visually. That's a conceptual representation. The AI does something different. It's the second layer above that. And so we need to provide. So if you ask me, will they trust it? My answer is yes, they will trust it, provided you give them the right parameters to anchor trust and over time build that trust. Hopefully that's helpful. All right, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, well, hang on, you're not done yet. Any more questions? Okay, thank you, Aparna. We know you have a busy research, busy travel schedule. She's headed to Nova Scotia to go talk right after, um, later in the week. And so thank you again for coming and for, for sponsoring Go as well from Open Search. So. Okay, I think we have, we have a break, right? Okay, so everybody, we got a break till 11.30, um, and we're all back here for the last presentation, okay? So thank you.